Greetings uh, all over the world to a great audience uh, who's listening to the special edition of American Academy of Oral Surgery Lectures. Myself, uh, Professor and Dr. Pritinder Singh. I'm the, also an ambassador of the American Academy of Oral Surgery. And uh, I'm also uh, faculty in the Department of uh, Implantology and uh, Periodontology and also a specialist uh, periodontist and implantology practice, uh, also an acclaimed international speaker. So I wanted to share uh, the great topic nowadays, appraisal of the treatment protocols for peri-implantitis. As you all know, the implants have developed significantly during the past two decades. It's the most widely accepted treatment modality with high success and predictability. So what is the burden here if we're talking of implants with so much of uh, success and feasibility? Uh, what is the burden here we're gonna talk about? Periimplantitis. Yes, it is a burden for every clinician. You can see in the pictures how periimplantitis is uh, affecting uh, the success of the implants. So the next question comes to uh, a clinicians or a patient's mind, are implants forever? Well, the answer is still uh, you know, uh, debatable. It, it, they can be forever if uh, we adhere to the uh, best surgical and uh, prosthodontic principles and also the patient compliance. And if at all the patient is suffering from peri-implant disease, how to cure? So if we follow the Protocols, yes, implants can be forever. Just uh, sharing one article with you, which I wrote in 2011 and published in the famous Journal of Oral Implantology by uh, myself uh, and cited by like hundreds and thousands of uh, future studies now. Uh, so, you know, that was a year back in 2011 and almost a decade now. And uh, things have been changing. My views on peri-implantitis have changed from 2011 to 2020. So as you can see in this uh, graphical presentation, uh, how peri-implantitis cases, they are on the rise. You can see from the year 2000 uh, to, uh, and then to 2019, how there is a rise in the cases of peri-implantitis. So as there is a rise in the case of implants and also in the case of peri-implantitis, we must adhere to the facts that uh, we need to have some treatment planning and strategy for uh, these uh, uh, treat, uh, cases of peri-implantitis. Despite the high success in survival rates of oral implants, failures do occur and implant supported prosthesis may require a substantial periodontal and prosthodontic maintenance over time. Yes, that's required. Implant failure, traditionally described as early or late. Early failures uh, are like prior to implant loading or at the time of uh, surgical implant or host related factors. Late failures after prosthodontic rehabilitation, biomechanical overload, so leading to bone loss and loss of osteointegration. Two common forms. Uh, before we uh, discuss the uh, strategies uh, of the treatment of perimplantitis, we'll have a brief summary of our perimplantitis and perimucositis, uh, inconsistencies in uh, defining and reporting uh, from early in 2003. Well, perimplant mucositis is an inflammatory response which is only surrounding to the limit to the, the soft tissues uh, surrounding a functioning oral implant, whereas perimplantitis involves loss of marginal bone around a functioning oral implant. So failed to get uh, set rigid clinical parameters in the year 1994. Uh, at the ITA consensus, we had similar definitions and some additional parameters for perimplantitis, that is plaque, presence of plaques, presence of separation, uh, bleeding and probing, uh, increases uh, probing depths greater than five millimeters. Peri-implant circular fluid uh, was analyzed as a diagnostic aid for peri-implantitis, the same way as we do for the uh, gingival crevicular fluid in case of uh, periodontitis. So this uh, fluid was given a lot of importance and studied, and we could uh, reach out to the inflammatory uh, markers. 
The term peri-implantitis you know, was uh, introduced by Mombele in 1987, which is essentially a destructive inflammatory process which affects the soft and hard tissues around us integrated implants, leading to the formation of a pocket around the implant and the loss of supporting bone. And uh, McAllister in 1992, he reported an entity which is very separate from peri-implantitis as a RPI or retrograde peri-implantitis. It is a clinically symptomatic peripical lesion that develops within the first few months after the insertion of the implant, while the coronal portion of the implant sustains a normal bone to implant interface. If we talk of epidemiology, wide range of prevalence values of peri-implantitis uh, over a five to 10 year period, 9.6% of implants and 18.18% of patients throughout the world are suffering from peri-implantitis. And if you talk of retrograde, it's less than one to 9.9%. Also, uh, if the patient is suffering from peri-implantitis, well, it is affected by smoking, poor oral hygiene, and uh, a history of uh, peridontitis as well. If we classify, uh, we have uh, on the basis of clinical status of peri-implant bone and the required therapy. This is a class one, slight horizontal bone loss with minimal peri-implant defect. This uh, figure shows a class one uh, peri-implantitis uh, defect moderate horizontal bone loss with an isolated vertical defect. This is a little bit advanced form than class one. Moderate to advanced horizontal bone loss with broad circular bony defect. As you can see in this picture, the, uh, almost the whole circumferential implant surface, uh, the bone has been lost. And class four, well, advanced horizontal bone loss with broad circumferential vertical defects as well as loss of oral or vestibular bony wall. You can see the damage in class four uh, case of peri-implantitis. So now as we'll be discussing through the presentation, we'll have different uh, uh, treatment options for all uh, uh, types of uh, peri-implantitis. Also, uh, the classification by Forum and Rosen, uh, they said that early uh, peri-implantitis uh, peri is probing depth greater than four mm and bone loss less than 25% of the implant length. Moderate peri-implantitis with 6 mm uh, or more of probing depth and 25 to 50% of bone loss of the full implant length. And in case of advanced peri-implantitis, we have probing depth much more than 6 mm, that is ranging to more than 8 mm. And bone loss is greater than 50% of the implant length. So, you know, you can uh, very well see how uh, with the advancing peri-implantitis, we have more loss of bone, which is the main supporting structure and uh, you know, uh, important for us integration. So, uh, Carl Mesh in 2014, he uh, you know uh, grouped according to the uh, you know success, uh, survival, and the failure uh, categories. And he uh, you know the management for the obviously for the success was normal, and for the survival we had we need to have reduction of stress on the implant, more maintenance. Uh, you know, uh, reinforcements, uh, oral hygiene uh, early, uh, and of a compromised health, reduction of stress, uh, any drug therapy, surgical reentry, or maybe change in the processes. And in case of failure of implants uh, during pain or mobility, uncontrolled exudates and separation, greater than 50% of bone loss. Uh, well, uh, you know, explantation or removal was suggested by Mesh in uh, Suzuki in. 2014. AP in 2013, the American Association of Perio, uh, they also had uh, uh, concepts about peri implantitis and peri implant mucositis. And then, uh, you know, I just talked about retrograde peri implantitis, which is, uh, uh, you know, according to uh, Rezor and Evans in 1995, uh, they said it's uh, like inactive lesion or infected lesion if it is an active lesion. And Sussman said it is implant to tooth. Type 1 and type 2 is to implant. So type 1 occurs during osteotomy preparation, either by a direct trauma or through indirect damage, which causes the adjacent pulp to undergo devitalization. And in case of type 2, shortly after the placement of the implant, when an adjacent tooth develops a peripical pathology, either by operative damage to the pulp or through reactivation of a prior apical lesion when we are doing the osteotomy. So, you know, 
this retrograde perimplantitis, you are caught unawares, uh, uh, not unawares actually, you know, uh, your wrong planning uh, uh, with respect to the distance uh, to the next tooth uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, uh, wrong assessment of the case and maybe uh, no use of a uh, cone beam uh, CBCT, uh, which can lead to these uh, deviations of in your treatment and in your treatment plan and, and might lead to retrograde perimplantitis. And yes, you know, this situation is like, you'll have a uh, great coronal bone and uh, perimplantitis from the apical end, which is, uh, you know, uh, very alarming to the clinician while he takes the radiograph after a few months uh, and sees retrograde perimplantitis, you know. So if we talk of etiology, you know, plaque or the bacterial infection, yes, it is a cause of perimplantitis. Biomechanical overload or the loading theory, yes, biomechanical overload, uh, a no for implants. Because, you know, uh, if we compare it to a tooth, uh, we have the pedontal ligament to be the stress uh, and the cushioning effect uh, of the uh, extra load, but in case of implants, uh, if we talk of trauma from occlusion, it's a big no in case of implants. Commonly found microflora, AAC, PGNG ballus, T for Scythia, P intermedia and C erectors, uh, etc. These are the commonly found microflora, which you will find in the plaque concept of perimplantitis. So evidence for a bacterial cause, yes, there is an evidence, uh, Perimplant microflora is established very shortly after placement because it's a part of our cavity. Successful implants experience no shifts in microbial composition over time. The, the values remain constant. Induction of perimplantitis by placement of plaque retentive ligatures was studied by Linda et al. and Lang et al. in 19. 92, 93, and they do, did, uh, uh, you know, come to the conclusions that bacteria is a cause of perimplantitis. And, you know, the therapy uh, by, uh, been studied by Mumbeli and Erickson, it aimed at a reduction of perimplant microflora. It improved the clinical conditions. So by these studies and research, you can, you know, very well conclude that how this is uh, uh, very uh, uh, vital, uh, the bacteria, uh, if I'm talking, in case of... Uh, uh, perimplantitis. Now, another factor, biomechanical overload, excessive biomechanical forces may lead to very high stress or micro uh, fractures in the coronal bone to implant contact and thus lead to loss of os integration around the neck of the implant. You know, and uh, this neck of the implant or the crestal bone loss is quite a major uh, uh, criteria for the success of, of an implant. So putting an extra occlusion overload through a wrong prosthodontic uh, approach, uh, through a wrong prosthesis, uh, the opposing arch, you might lead to crystal bone loss and eventually you can lose the implant. Now, uh, discussing all the factors, you need to diagnose perimplantitis as well. Well, the indices are similar to periodontal, like bleeding index, plaque index, uh, you know, probing depth, etc. Perimplant uh, probing depth, uh, it's uh, three to four mm. You can consider it normal. Bleeding after gentle probing, there is exudation and separation, you know, uh, and uh, preferably a plastic uh, pedantal probe or TPS probe or an automated probe should be used to uh, evaluate a case of uh, perimplantitis. Uh, mobility is quite a late stage of perimplantitis, which is insensitive, pain, Perimplant circular fluid analysis. A lot of stress has been given to perimplant circular fluid analysis now. In this case, you can uh, evaluate uh, or uh, uh, find out the factors which are responsible for causing perimplantitis at a very early stage, and you can control it via antimicrobial therapy or regimens, which we're going to talk about in the later presentation. Microbial monitoring to determine the microbial composition of a peri-implanted site. You, you know, we can culture the, uh, the circular fluid and find out the causative organism and treat it accordingly. So take the radiographs, uh, uh, as you can see, for vertical bone loss, saucer shape defects, and obviously a progressive bone loss is a definite indicator for an implant uh, uh, going to be failed soon. So uh, by the 
uh, you know, radio graphs and the peri implant circular fluids and the indices uh, and the probings. This is how we are going to assess the success of the implant or whether the implant is going towards peri implantitis or peri mucositis. Treatment focus. Removal of the contaminating agent. Yes, we have to remove the agent, whether it is uh, antimicrobial or it is biomechanical overload. Systemic antibiotics, one of the choice. Mechanical debridement, which can be done with or without systemic antibiotic treatment, uh, with the local drug deliveries and chlorhexidine rinses, combined with laser decontamination. And then the treatment comes, uh, the surgical debridement, which can be done with or without uh, use of bone grafts, that is the guided bone regeneration. So the initial phase of treatment of peri implantitis, uh, let's talk about the crucial th therapy. When biomechanical overload or excessive forces are the main etiologic factor, it includes prosthetic design changes, improvement in implant number and position, and also occlusal adjustments. In terms of anti-infective therapy, we have to talk about microbial etiology, local removal of plaque deposits, as I told you with the plastic instrument, polishing of the accessible surfaces with pumice or air polishing, subgingival irrigation of the peri-implant pockets with 0.2% chlorhexidine, and also systemic antimicrobial therapy for 10 consecutive days. So anti-infective therapy is very much required when the bacterial load is the cause of peri-implantitis. Now, when we talk of treatment, we should know of uh, the treatment which corresponds to uh, uh, non-surgical therapy first. Indications, mucosal inflammation detected by clinical signs, radiographical bone level stable, and there is a phase one therapy before the surgery. So you can see, we can use the various instruments, the plastic instruments, the airflow instruments, the orthopiezo, they can be used uh, to, uh, uh, do a non-surgical therapy to remove uh, as a phase one therapy or as a oral prophylactic procedure for the implants. Then comes the debridement or the detoxification. Debridement can be done with the help of plastic curates, carbon curates, rubber points, abrasive paste, UV uh, ultrasonic scaling plus Teflon, or, or the titanium brush. As you can see in the figure, how a titanium brush is used, how a rubber cup is used, how a plastic instrument is used around the peri-implant uh, uh, zone where the bone uh, loss has occurred. So, you know, uh, no metal instruments are to be used to prevent any sort of uh, uh, damage to the implant and promote further colonization. Antiseptics, we can use citric acid and tetracyclines as an irrigation agent for detoxification and also uh, for the implant surface and antibiotics, metronidazole, and if uh, GBR is to be done, uh, research studies have shown doxycycline and onidazole have shown to give very promising results. Disadvantage, fail to promote the re integration of the exposed implant sites. This was a disadvantage during the non-surgical therapy. There was no re integration and we what re we sh our aim is to re integrate the implant. After all, the success of the implant depends on the osseo integration. So other treatment modalities, mechanical or ultrasonic debridement with local drug deliveries, laser treatment with and without the excess, flap excess, open flap debridement, or with uh, guided bone regeneration. If we talk of local drug delivery, peri-implantitis lesions are usually well demarcated. They can be, uh, you know, uh, uh, the zones, the peri-implantitis zones can be uh, assessed with local drug deliveries, which uh, lead to sustained high dose of antimicrobial agents at the site of peri-implantitis as uh, uh, minocycline spheres, tetracycline fibers, etc. They there are more improvements in probing depth compared to chlorhexidine gel sustained for six months as studied by Redwood et al. in 2008. So minocycline spares uh, or use of minocycline in, as a local drug delivery in case of peri-implantitis sites has given very promising results after you are done with the detoxification of the surface once or the debridement once. Coming to irradiation with the soft tissue laser. You know, uh, various lasers, CO2 lasers or the soft tissue lasers, uh, you can use these lasers with and without flap access. Uh, the laser uh, aims to uh, dis destroy the bacterial cells. Plaque control measures should be adhered to reduce the effect of plaque. 
and also uh, by the study of Nicholas Peters in 2012, he noted that after six months, there was positive treatment and improvements were uh, noted with the use of lasers as uh, there was destruction of the bacterial cells. So laser therapy, uh, if we say uh, related to the uh, uh, peri-implantitis, it is termed as LAPIP, the LAPIP treatment, that is the laser-assisted peri-implantitis procedure. It is designed to preserve implants and protect the surrounding tissue from further decay. As we use the LENAP technique, that is the laser-assisted new attachment procedure in case of a tooth. In case of an implant, we call it as an uh, LAPIP treatment procedure, that is laser-assisted peri-implantated procedure. And within a period of six months, uh, you, uh, we get promising results. As you can see, this is a peri-implantitis zone. The laser, uh, after the debridement, the laser is inserted. Uh, the laser beam is inserted onto the implant. And uh, after a while, we uh, proceed with the guided bone regeneration. And eventually, we get some promising results. So laser also plays a role, a uh, very effective role in case of uh, treating perimplantitis. Comparison of adjunctive use of LDD and laser, equally effective, complete resolution of inflammation not achieved with either of two. They are effective, yes, but the study of uh, Cher uh, et al, he said complete resolution is still not possible whether we are using uh, local drug deliveries or laser uh, as a part of non-surgical therapy. The, they don't give so promising results. Another treatment uh, modality is the photodynamic therapy, which generates reactive oxygen species by multiplicity with the help of high energy single frequency light uh, using diode lasers in combination with photosensitizers, for example, tolerated in blue or the metal in blue. Uh, the concentration of the dye that is a tolerated in blue ranges between 10, gram, 10 and 50 micrograms per ml. It is bactericidal against the bacteria, mainly responsible for peri-implantitis as AAC, P. valis, Prevotella intermedia, Streptococcus mutans, and Enterococcus fecalis. Manual treatment by titanium curates and glycine air powder, plus the use of photodynamic therapy, that is debridement and uh, detoxification, along with adjunct uh, photodynamic therapy for 12 months, as studied by Bessie et al. Bessie et al. It le led to a reduction of pathogenic bacteria, also interleukin 1 beta, the inflammatory markers. So, photodynamic therapy also gave a promising treatment uh, as an adjunct uh, in cases of early periimplantitis. A case, uh, in, you can see in this case, how this implant uh, is bleeding and separating, showing a case of perimplantitis. The implant is, the flap is raised and the implant is exposed in the picture. You can see in the picture, the implant is exposed. The metallic blue dye is applied onto the implant surface as a part of photodynamic therapy. And the light was, uh, the, uh, using the diode laser was activated and followed by the photodynamic therapy, a technique of GBR was followed in which you can see, we can we have inserted uh, you know, a xenograft and we have placed a membrane on top of the exposed implant surface. This is the uh, picture after uh, suturing and this is the picture after six months, complete resolution of inflammation and no absence of uh, peri-implantitis was seen using photodynamic therapy. So photodynamic therapy is also giving promising results. Now coming to a uh, systematic review uh, by Laura Poe et al. in 2011, he said that treatment of choice, if it is a smooth implant surface, go for a non-metal instrument or a rubber cup. If it is a rough implant surface, non-metal instruments plus an air abrasive to create it smooth. And if smoothing of the surface roughness is required, then use metal instruments and burns. The clinical impact of these uh, findings still requires some clarification. Research is still going on. The third EAO consensus conference in 2012, peri-implant mucositis, yes, it is treated successfully. Peri-implantated, it has limited efficacy. Clinical recommendations, patients should be monitored regularly for plaque control, signs of peri-implant infection. You know, 
this monitoring is known as high vigilance monitoring high vigilance monitoring is like uh, very strict monitoring at regular intervals keeping all the records and also patients compliance a regular maintenance program for the long term management of periimplantitis lesions is uh, very much required uh, you know in these cases coming to the surgical treatment of periimplantitis periimplant resective therapy identify the type of osseous defect before you decide the treatment modality in the earlier slides i showed you the classification of uh, bone uh, according to the periimplantitis how it was classified according to the bone loss apically displaced flap techniques and osseous resective therapy are used to correct moderate to severe horizontal bone loss moderate uh, vertical bone defects reduce the overall pocket depth and also implant position in a anesthetic area surface polishing uh, is or implantoplasty what we call is very much required before the resection what is objective of surface polishing to arrest the progression of the disease to achieve a maintainable site by the patient you know ultimately after the, any treatment whether it is non surgical or surgical it is the patient who is going to uh, do the homework which is you know comes under the patient compliance implant topography should be altered with high speed diamond burrs and polishes to produce a smooth continuous surface it's performed before any osseous resective therapy is initiated and with profuse irrigation as you can see in the picture how the uh, implantoplasty has been done and you know uh, irrigated properly and we get a polished surface for future treatment for the treatment coming to peri implant regenerative therapy aim to accomplish regeneration of lost bone and reintegration guided bone regeneration and bone grafting techniques they have been suggested and also not only suggested they play a very important role in peri implant uh, regenerative therapy gbr uh, uses a non resolvable uh, membrane uh, for healing of bone defects seen at the time of implant placement with uh, and around failing implants then we have the submerged regenerative therapy uh, we allow the implant to close with the flap in cases of moderate to advanced circumferential defects to or three wall uh, bone defects detoxification of implant surface is possible you can see in the picture how the periimplantitis zone has been exposed there is bone evident bone loss uh, the uh, after the implantoplasty the bone graft is inserted and uh, covered with a membrane and how uh, after the uh, surgery is done we have uh, some promising results using a submerged regenerative therapy used with a uh, guided bone regeneration technique now this is the case of periimplantitis uh, in the implants uh, you can see in the radiograph and in the clinical picture a case of periimplantitis process is removed uh, the flap is elevated implants are expo you can see the exposure of the implants uh, how the periimplantitis has uh, uh, you know involved the bony aspect and now this is was treated with uh, the the bone grafting uh, gbr technique and uh, with the collagen membrane uh, uh, with a submerged implant uh, regenerative therapy and sutured properly and this is the radiograph after 6 months you can see the absence of uh, periimplantitis and you can say we got uh, this is a case of uh, reosseous integration and you can see the x-ray and the clinical picture of the implants if you compare the defect you, you see a complete bone fill so we uh, are looking at a case of reosseous integration using some merged uh, therapy for uh, regenerative implants now again in 2012 the third eo consensus superior to non surgical therapy for periimplantitis it should include removal of the granulation tissue thorough cleaning of the implant surface adjunctive measures better but variable outcomes influenced the regenerative or resective approach adjunct to mechanical instrumentation regenerative surgery use of a membrane does not seem to improve the healing results so this consensus said uh, use of a membrane or uh, no use of a membrane they gave similar results so now it's the clinician's choice to use a membrane or to avoid the membrane in case of uh, uh, these uh, dealing with such cases of periimplantitis using the uh, bone grafting technique 
no explantation or implant extraction now there are cases of you know involving uh, more than 50% of the bone loss uh, of the full of the of the implant as you can see in the radiograph there is uh, almost a bone loss uh, seen in the radiograph along the length of the implant now in this case there is suppurative exudate there is a uh, great bleeding on probing, severely increased probing depths greater than or equal to eight millimeters. So in this case, it's better to take out the implant, that is implant extraction or explantation and plan for another implant later on. Radiographically, it may be extending along the outline of the implant. That is more than half the length. As you can see in the radiograph, the implant will be mobile when you check the mobile. Uh, the mobility and non-surgical and surgical therapy in these cases are quite ineffective. No heroic attempts should be made in case of uh, uh, radiographs like this involving so much bone loss. Uh, it, you know, would lead to eventually lead to a failure. No reintegration can be uh, you know anticipated in case of uh, such defects and in mobile implants. Now, we talked of retrograde perimplantitis as in earlier slides, which I told you that could be the, the, the surgeon could be caught unawares. Uh, many treatment modalities available. We, you know, implant extraction, peripical surgery. Implant extraction is not a treatment. It's just, you know, yeah, uh, the implant has failed, nothing to do, extract the implant. Peripical surgery, with or without implant apex resection, debride the implant. Regenerative therapy, local de decontamination by use adjunctive antimicrobials or the LABIP technique or the lasers, antibiotics. No conclusive evidence to advocate any specific treatment approach for retrograde perimplantitis. A combination uh, treatment is usually uh, effective in this case of retrograde perimplantitis. Coming to decision tree for the management of perimplantitis. If there is mobility, yes, it is a failed implant, remove the implant. If there is no mobility, you see the bone loss. If during the bone loss, it is a failed implant, yes, check the extent of bone loss. If it is greater than half of implant fixture, we recommend remove the implant or redevelop the site. If it is less than half implant fixture, check the amount of bone loss. If it is greater than two mm, surgical treatment with apically positioned flap, Osseous resection possible, guided bone regeneration, lab surgery plus or minus antibiotics. If it is less than 2 mm, go for non surgical treatment, uh, root planning, implant uh, decontamination, antibiotics, lasers, etc., as an adjunct. And if there is no bone loss, it is an ailing implant. If there is bone loss, we call it a failed implant. In case of ailing implant, it is peri-implant mucositis, which is absolutely treatable uh, with non-surgical treatment alone, subgingival irrigation, local and systemic antibiotics, antimicrobial mouth rinsings. So this tree, uh, tree uh, of treatment for peri-implantitis is uh, very necessary. You can classify your defect or your peri-implantitis case according to this uh, tree. Uh, treatment tree and your treatment is uh, quite easy if you plan it according to this chart. Implant with perimplantitis in case of uncontrolled systemic diseases, go for palliative treatment. In case of patients undergoing chemo, radiotherapy, or the moronge, uh, again, you can go for a palliative treatment. In case of circumferential infrabony defects, you can go for uh, deprivement, resective treatment, surface treatment, local or systemic antibiotics, regenerative treatment. And in case, case of a horizontal humoral defect, go for a pocket reduction, deprivement, surface treatment, followed by maintenance. And if there are options of explantation, if there is intact connection, you can try for the reverse talk technique to uh, take out the implant or do the explant technique. If it is fractured implant, you can use trefine plus reverse talk technique. And if it is a one body implant, you have to use a trefine to take out or the expl uh, uh, explant. And after that, once you are uh, taking out the implant, you can go for the replantation uh, technique. This is another. Uh, you know, treatment plan uh, or a tree for uh, implants with perimplantitis in patients who are suffering from various disorders as well. So, you know, 
So their treatment should be based on uh, uh, the patient's uh, uh, criteria and also uh, the involving the medical history of the patients as well. Trefining, if you say, is the most invasive option for implant removal and should only be employed when all other methods are exhausted. This is a this is a very common uh, consensus of most of the research papers. And uh, also if uh, I suggest my own experience, yes, this is the last option uh, to be used uh, for uh, uh, implant removal. Try the reverse talk technique, uh, et cetera. But okay, if nothing is available, you have to use it to find. Maintenance, very important. When we talk of treatment of periimplantitis, maintenance, okay, to talk of any treatment, periodontitis, peri, uh, uh, normal placement of implant, uh, diseased implant, perimucositis, periimplantitis, maintenance plays a very important role. So after surgical intervention, all patients are placed on a closed recall schedule, maintenance visits every three months minimum. This allows for the proper vigilant monitoring. As I told you, in these cases, we need a vigilant monitoring of plaque levels, soft tissue inflammation, and changes in the level of the bone. So, you know, various intraoral devices uh, uh, for care and maintenance uh, can be used. The uh, flossing around the implants, the Subjective irrigation around the implants, everything comes and the, and the proper care comes under the maintenance. Supportive periodontal therapy recommendation. No evidence is available to suggest a frequency of recall intervals to propose specific hygiene regimes. Train patient for a self-performed plaque control. That is the best supportive care program. Recall the patient every three to six months. Clinically examine the patient every three six or 12 months, depending on the severity. Radiographic documentation is very important for implant placement. Prosthetics every single year. High bleeding and probing scores. If at all, during the earliest stages, please go for radiographic examination to involve uh, uh, or study the uh, periimplantitis bone defects for the radiograph. It's greater than 5 mm. Please don't rely only on probing. Please use the radiographs as a diagnostic uh, measure for periimplantitis. Now, coming to a very important technique or therapy CIST, C I S T, cumulative interceptive supportive therapy. Protocol of therapeutic measures depend on the clinical and the radiographic diagnosis. Diagnosis is the key characteristic in this therapy. Cumulate is cumulative in nature, not a single procedure. Rather, it is a sequence of four uh, therapeutic procedures with increasing antibacterial potential, depending on the severity and extent of the lesion. You know, mention none other than uh, Lang et al. 2004, a great person. Met, them, met him at various conferences in person, lectured with him as well. Uh, you know, and a great uh, uh, periodontist and implantologist. His protocol of CIST involves four treatment modalities for different preimplant tissue conditions, such as mechanical debridement, followed by antiseptic treatment, antibiotic treatment, and if then uh, nothing's there, then we go for and, uh, regenerative or resective surgery. So this is the uh, CIST approach. It is the protocol is presented. Pocket drip less than 3 mm, no plaque or bleeding on probing, no therapy is required. Probing drip less than 3 mm with plaque, bleeding on probing, yes, mechanical cleaning, polishing, oral hygiene instructions. Probing drip 4 to 5 mm without radiographic bone loss, go for mechanical cleaning, air polishing, oral hygiene instructions plus local anti infective therapy. Chlorodexidine is very useful for three to four weeks. Probing depth greater than five millimeters with less than two mm radiographic bone loss, mechanical cleaning, polishing, microbiological testing, local and systemic anti infective therapy. And if probing depth is greater than five mm with uh, uh, more than two mm radiographic bone loss, Please plan for resective or regenerative surgery. So this is the CIST protocol, very easy according to the pocket depths and uh, the, the probing depths as in the radiographic bone loss. So in my opinion, whenever you're planning any uh, treatment of periimplantitis, please keep the decision trees in the earlier slides I showed you and this protocol 
the treatment of periimplantitis is going to be very uh, helpful and you can say easy as well. So uh, talking of mechanical debridement, supportive therapy protocol A, that is plaque, uh, removed by polishing by using rubber cups, polishing paste, uh, calculus by carbon fiber curates, conventional steel curates or ultrasonic curates, instruments with metal dips avoided. We are not going to use metal with implants. Leave daily marked damage on the implant surface, which is attracting more plaque. So we have, our aim is to get a polished surface, not a rough surface. So please uh, avoid uh, steel curates. Uh, let, let it be plastic instruments or carbon fiber curates. Antiseptic treatment, supportive therapy protocol B. In this case, daily rinse with any concentrations available in your countries, 0 0.1, 0 0.12, or 0.2% of chlorhexidine gluconate mouthwash, gel or a gel applied to the desired action. Three to four weeks of regular use is necessary. Quite evident, uh, promising results were, are obtained by using a regular regime of chlorhexidine digluconate as a supportive therapy uh, for antisepsis. Protocol C. Antibiotic treatment to eliminate or reduce the pathogens. Done in the last 10 days of the antiseptic treatment, metronidazole, TID, or nidazole BD, treatment of uh, other or the uh, you know, regimens of choice, uh, prophylactic procedures instituted to prevent reinfection, local antibiotic application. I told you LDDs or the local drug deliveries, they are very much as an, used as an adjunct to this treatment and quite powerful as well. You can use tetracycline and you know my favorite microspheres containing uh, minocycline hyclate. Minocycline spheres are very effective in case of antibiotic treatment, in terms of local drug deliveries, in case of uh, perimplantitis zones. Then the protocol D, which is a regenerative or resective upon your choice, done to accomplish regeneration of lost bone tissue and re integration. Now this is our aim. We have to re integrate the implant, which we have uh, seen suffering from perimplantitis. It is the growth of new bone in direct contact with the previously contaminated implant surface without an intervening band of organized connective tissue. The definition is similar to uh, osseointegration, but now the implant has suffered from peri-implantitis. We are we going to have another bonding of the bone to the implant uh, by the various techniques, hence the term re -integration. So the main aim, as you can say, after the peri-implantitis, uh, the main aim of a clinician is uh, to get uh, the surrounding bone back to normal, which is re integration. The future is ahead and very promising. We just had, uh, you know, uh, a long talk of perimplantitis, how it's uh, caused, the etiologies. We talked about the decision trees. We talked about how to diagnose, which instruments to use. Then we had the various protocols and decision trees. Then we talked about uh, non-surgical therapies and the surgical therapies, the maintenance therapies. This all has been evident in literature till now. We are working on all these treatments with success. So, as the evolution is uh, you know much required i think we need to look beyond these concepts the future is coming ahead and promising there are studies and research going on additive manufacturing of titanium alloy could modify the pathogenic microbial profile titanium this produced via additive manufacturing they could alter the microbial profile of the biofilm formed around them so you know, future studies are going on with the, with the modified uh, implant surfaces uh, with pathogenic microbial profile. So they'll, these will be much more effective in uh, uh, causing uh, uh, perimplantitis. They, there will be less perimplantitis if this uh, technique goes very well. In an attempt to prevent or treat bacterial colonization on dental implant or its components, metallic nanoparticles have been investigated as a potential coating material on titanium substrates. So nanotechnology is uh, uh, 
is a, is a, is a branch which is now dealing with the uh, newer surfaces of implants and how this nanoparticles, they have been in, uh, investigated as a coating on titanium substrates and how these uh, uh, will affect on future peri-implantitis cases is the results are quite promising. To develop an antibiotic loaded hydrogel loaded to offer a local protection for implants against bacteria without interfering with bone acquisition or inducing a local or system uh, systemic inflammatory reaction. Another recent approach is layer by layer coating deposition, which is the LBL technique, which could lead to higher efficacy and fewer adverse effects uh, regarding controlled release of antimicrobial substances. So another uh, very promising... Uh, it could lead to higher efficacy and fewer is uh, hydrogel loaded uh, protection to the implants. So the future is uh, great. And I hope uh, we are getting all this uh, treatment protocol soon uh, uh, in the clinics and we are able to control peri-implantitis with much more efficacy uh, with the latest techniques and implants. Now, coming to the conclusion for my lecture, implant placement not only should be prosthetically driven, it has to be cleansability directed a very important line, not only prosthetically driven, it has to be cleansability directed. Means if it is cleansability directed, we have, we have, we'll have severe, we have less severe chances of perimucositis and perimplantitis. Prosthetic designs need to facilitate hygiene measures professionally and at home. Correct three-dimensional implant placement has to be followed to enable adequate running room and emergence profile. Patients should be informed in detail about the possibility of developing any inflammation around implants. Informed consent is very important. Oral hygiene practices should be given on a regular basis at least once a year. Prophylactic measures should be, uh, uh, you know, intervened if mucosite is noted around the implant. You know, stop the stop stop the uh, inflammation at the mucosite itself. You pocket with a probing depth of six mm or more, and you can uh, go for uh, uh, the study of the ecological niche. CIS protocol, CIST protocol should be followed. Optimum oral hygiene standard should be maintained for peri-implantitis therapy. And let's see how the, uh, the future studies are going to be promising for us. I hope one day peri-implantitis will be controlled to a larger extent and we see much more successful cases of implants along with uh, you know, the support of the clinician as well as the patients. Thank you very much for any questions, queries, my courses, uh, et cetera. This is my email to be contacted, implant underscore dentist at the rate of yahoo.com. Hope it was a fruitful lecture uh, for peri-implantitis and I was uh, able to justify my topic. Thank you very much.